Hi, I'm going to do a two-part piece here, two videos on the history, a quick history of the Columbia Phonograph Company, later known as the Columbia Graphophone Company, which we will explain to you. One thing you have to understand right away about the Columbia Phonograph Company is that it was part of a network of companies set up by the Edison Company. Uh, Edison went into partnership with a fellow by the name of Jesse Lippincott to create business districts for business machines, which was wildly unsuccessful. It was a disaster. They lost their share. Uh, there were only two districts that actually made money. You had the New York District, New Jersey District, uh, District of Columbia District, you know, et cetera. And a district out in San Francisco was doing well, and a district in the District of Columbia was doing very well. In fact, what they were doing was they were saying to hell with business machines, let's put music on the cylinders. And they did. And they were popular and they were selling. So they were making money. And eventually the house of Edison and Lippincott came crashing down. And the Columbia Phonograph Company just seceded and formed its own company, Marketing Musical Cylinders. Now, in the same time, in Washington, D.C., was the Bell Tainter Graphophone Company. Now, this was a descendant of the initial work done by Alexander Graham Bell. Bell was never fond of Edison, and the feeling was mutual. And so, when Bell made his improvements on the phonograph, just as Edison had made improvements on the telephone, uh, he decided to try to get even with Edison. And one of the things that he did when he created his device, he spoonerized the name phonograph and called it graphophone, just to annoy Edison a little bit. And it did, it worked. And so this company was producing little spools of wax covered um, cardboard. The wax was called ozocerite, and they were kind of fragile, but they decided to merge with the Columbia Phonograph Company. And so the end result of this organization would become the Columbia Graphophone Company, and basically producing um, wax cylinders. They were relocated in Washington, D.C., would eventually move to New York City, um, but they were always in cylinders, never with discs. Now, it's interesting to note also in Washington, D.C. was Berliner, the Berliner interest. So all these groups are all together in the same general area. It's also an interesting thing to note that a lot of the early recording artists of those days were government, government employees. Uh, John York Atlee was in the mailroom at the Capitol and was always making recordings and whistling songs. And had a great career outside of mail. Um, and so they moved to, to New York and they were trying to find ways of stopping the Berliner company because Berliner was starting to grow in leaps and bounds. They had a great advertising agent. They had a product that worked well the, and it was cheap. Wasn't that expensive? And so the crack lawyer for the Columbia Graphophone Company was a fellow by the name of Philip Morrow. And he was trying to find a way to stop Berliner in his tracks. And so he studied the patents. He studied the Berliner gramophone. And finally he found something that caught his interest, and that was a patent taken out by Bell and Tainter. Now, just so you know, Alexander Graham Bell gets a lot of the credit, but the Bell and Tainter machine and records were developed by uh, Alexander Bell's cousin, Chick Chister Bell, and Charles Tainter, who was assigned just to get the record straight so you know a Bell Tainter machine were those gentlemen. Um, he looked at a patent for the Bell Tainter cylinder machine and discovered one that said a needle moved by a groove. And what this was, was a needle assembly in the back of the machine that would automatically feed 
the floating stylus across the wax cylinder. Well, he gave it a rather liberal interpretation. He said, if I take a Berliner gramophone and put a Berliner record on it, and I put a needle in the reproducer, put the needle down on the record, what happens? The needle is moved by a groove. And so, with this very liberal interpretation of a patent, Philip Morrow is able to bring down the House of Berliner through an injunction. It's incredible. Now, his advertising agent is a fellow by the name of Frank Seaman, who basically creates Zonophone records, which are basically copies of Berliners. And in fact, a number of the recordings are bootleg Berliner records to begin with. And so Columbia doesn't bother him. He's, he's not a problem right now, but he's a good ally to have. During this time, Philip Morrow's trying to find a way to get Columbia into the disc industry. Not as easy as one would say, because even though Berliner is out of the running at the moment, he had the patents for disc records. But something was changing. There was a fellow by the name of Joseph Jones, who had worked for Berliner, worked with Eldridge Johnson, who was going to found Victor. And he observed Johnson doing lots of experiments with wax and making discs with a wax master. And so Jones discovered also that Johnson wasn't applying for a patent. So Jones did. And he applied for it. It was rejected. He applied again, changed things, it was rejected. Finally, Philip Morrow came into the picture. He took the application, tweaked it in various ways that he knew would get approval. And they give Joseph Jones $25,000 for this patent because they know this is going to be worth its weight in gold. Also, at this time, the Columbia Company, under the control of a fellow by the name of, of Easton, contacts a group in New Jersey called the Burt Company. They're located in Milburn, New Jersey, and they made billiard balls, and chess pieces, and things like that, all made of uh, basically a shellac type of mixture. And so they work out a deal that the Burt Company could make records for uh, Columbia. Now, there's an issue here that they still had to deal with, that Columbia still did not have a patent in disc manufacturing or disc recording. Therefore, anything that they made would be basically infringement. So they worked out a deal with the Burt Company, and the Burt Company created a company within it called the Globe Record Company. And the Globe Record Company would produce records. Now, the recording engineer is kind of an interesting fellow. His name was uh, John English. I believe. Last name was English. And he was the recording engineer for Zonophone. And actually, he had been with Berliner before. And so Columbia hires English to record the Globe Records for about two or three weeks and in the beginning of production, and it's small production initially, the Globe Records come out and they are basically just um, without labels and they just have indentations on them showing what the record is, the title of the song, and the artist. That's it. Now, uh, I'm running out of time here. I'm going to switch to the second part of this. And you'll see the amazing things that happen in the creation of this company in the years of 1901 to 1902.